Settler File. Welcome back to the Settler Files. It's Murray Corf sitting in for Howard Settler today. Howard's off to do a bit more of his therapy and we wish him well in that quest. And with me at the moment is John Ryan, international security and terrorism expert extraordinaire. Welcome along, John. I like the extraordinaire. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, not too many superlatives that uh, that work so well. John, um, we were just talking prior to coming on air about a, uh, your sojourn to Queensland in recent weeks and months. Um, to participate in a trial, was it? Of a, no, it was a, a committal hearing. A committal hearing, was it? Of a, a murder that happened 41 years and 10 months ago. Yeah. The, Good Lord. It was a triple murder and kidnap, actually. Was it? And, and it took 41 years and 10 months for it to get to a committal hearing. Yeah, well, there had been in 1980, there actually was a coroner's inquest who nom- nominated the two people. Uh, but the... Um, prosecutor at the time said there was no case to answer. It was only hearsay and threw the whole lot out. They didn't even have to appear. And, Goodness um, me. Yeah, ironically, that same uh, prosecutor was found in the Fitzgerald Inquiry to be corrupt. Yeah. Um, surprise, surprise. But, uh, mm. you know, that same guy is now a uh, senior counsel. Again, I guess everything gets forgiven in Queensland. Really? Yes. Oh, dear <laughs> me. Wheels, with, that's extraordinary. Well, uh Look, I was born there and grew up there. And mm. uh, when I went back and started my um, agency in 72, I was hired by um, to bodyguard the staff of a couple of nightclubs there. And I knew the nightclub scene. I'd been involved in it since the 60s. Mm. And um, we were getting told it was going to be firebombs and murders and protection rackets. And the Good police were laughing at it. And so, so were we because... Uh, they already ran the rackets. <laughs> Nobody was going to come in and start something. Yeah. But uh, I remember I was there for quite a few months, and uh, the owners were um, being liquidated. I was working for the liquidators. And on the Sunday night, they had uh, fought and fought for weeks and weeks to get back um, a scheme of arrangement to take back the clubs from the liquidator. They got it. And on the Sunday night, Sunday morning, when I finished, one of the little brothers who owned them, Checkers and Whiskey A Go Go, told me that I wasn't needed anymore. Mm. And my information from the streets was uh, he needed me more than ever because uh, what he had started by rumour had turned into fact. And 12 days before that, a nightclub had been burned out. And um, matter of fact, on Monday morning, I rang a Commonwealth and two state cops and said it was going to happen this week. And unfortunately, 2 a.m. Thursday morning, it did and 15 people were killed. It was the biggest mass murder in Australia up until Tasmania. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so this was the Whiskey A Go Go Club, is that right? Yeah, sure was. Mm, goodness me, I and, uh, do remember that so well. Well, ironically, it took us until 2014 for one of the girls that survived and myself and a few other people to get a memorial plaque with the victims' names on it and was put it down in March 2014, and the government had nothing to do with it. Really? They never contributed in any way, shape, or form. Why was that? They wanted to go away. Two people were convicted uh, Mm. who shouldn't have been. And um, matter of fact, they even had witnesses that one of them was nowhere near it when it happened. But um, they said, oh, he was setting up an alibi. Okay. Things were, there was no evidence against any of the people at all. It was just verbals. It's terribly sad when a government just ignores something in the hope that it will go away. You know? Well, they're still doing it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's, the, that's the sad part as the well, I guess. The sad part about it has been so many government changes, but it hasn't made any difference to the whiskey a go-go. Mm. And um, <laughs> 10 months later, um, the guy that was supposed to be the driver that night, and I believe he was, and I know he was from the street, and had been involved in the first fire, uh, his wife rang me for protection, get her and her two children out of town. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'd seen her at the Wolfies Club and a couple of other places. I knew she was married to a gangster, and I knew there was a contract on me. There'd been a few attempts, and um, I didn't believe her, but she finally convinced me because she told me some of the other things I had files on myself mm. and confirmed what I had, and uh, she wanted me to wait till the, there was a birthday that weekend, 13-year-old mm. birthday. Wait till that was over, and her husband, her estranged husband, would come and see the girl. And um, But when I went over, they were gone. Mm. And... Uh, we were told to be a domestic, a domestic the night before, and I knew they'd been kidnapped. And Goodness I knew if me. I found them, they'd be dead. Mm. 11-year-old, a 13-year-old, and their mom. 
Well, it's always bugged me a bit. The two girls were total innocents in the mm. whole game that was being played in Brisbane at the time. Mm. And were they found? Never been found. Still haven't been found. Good Lord. And they're only three of at least 13 others that I'm aware of between 66 and the 70s mm. that I'm aware of. And uh, everybody hopes it all go away. I'm sorry if my mouth is hanging open. <laughs> it's the story that you tell is just amazing. It really is. Well, I remember on the uh, a female that I went to school with actually got on the um, one of the missing and murdered blogs and said, "Oh, you know, please don't have any record of you because you know they don't take me as a drug addicts." But mm. during a recent committal hearing, her daughter got on there and said, "Yes, they not only did that, they <laughs> killed another fifteen mm. people." So. <laughs> Dear me, how, so, how on earth do you keep up with all of this stuff that goes on? I mean, it's just... Well, I, I went back to Brisbane. I've been going back to Brisbane since, oh, the early 90s. Um, I even had sponsors, my wife, my family, and a few other people. I've been mean, flying backwards and forwards trying to keep it alive. That um, You know, there might have been two people convicted over the whiskey, but there were other people involved as well that were dead, missing. Mm, mm. And then, the, then my three, my, my client's dead. Mm. And um, I, I was just um, – so in the end I got frustrated because I knew there were even uh, – newspaper reporters were involved with the crooked cops as well and um, everything was all nice and uh, fluffy whenever they wrote about them, you know. Even mm. when they were caught taking bribes, it would appear in the paper as not so bad, you know. Mm. Mm. So I uh, <laughs> – Just the power of the media can dilute things and it can – Oh, it's st- look, it still happens there. Of course I was, it does. I, was, I mean, one guy bought out this so-called book. He's a crime reporter and all this sort of crap, and he brings out a book and said, I was a bouncer there and I wasn't, and he knew that because yeah. I, I supplied some of the stuff for his books. Yeah. So yeah. nothing's changed. But <laughs> the So what I did, I wrote a book. And mm. well, I, what I did was I extrapolated a lot of my stuff from 71 to 78 out of – I've been keeping written records since the 60s, mm. still do. And so I extrapolated some stuff out. I'm not a writer, and uh, my family and I, we actually got a publish and we had it published. 2012, mm. 13, it came out. And uh, that generated some interest, and uh, which was the whole idea. I wanted a plaque for the victims of the whiskey, and I wanted something done about Barbara and the kids. And mm. both those things have now happened. Mm. And people came forward and confirmed what I'd said, and the reason that Barb was going to finally open up everything, only myself and a couple of cops knew, and somebody came forward and said the same thing. So mm. that was cool. And so your book called I Survived, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what an amazing – I mean, I can understand where you got the title from. I well, really my, can. My wife thought of the title. Actually, she said, I survived Brisbane Underbelly. And I said, yeah, you know, that's right. That's, I yeah. survived. And – um Because what had happened back in those days, we had a guy in Brisbane. He was like the Howard Sattler of Brisbane, I think Mm. you should call him. His name was Hayden Sargent. Oh, yes, yes. Him and I became quite friendly. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of work for him uh, when he was helping people. I did a lot of investigation to see if they were real. Really needed help, if you know what I mean. Yes, yes, and we're pulling the con trick, yeah. Hayden had me like, he said, you know what, you, don't be like everybody else because if you were threatened, people would keep quiet and they'd hide away and all that. He said, be high profile. I'll keep you high profile. So I did. So he interviewed me live on air and he said, you know, there's a contract out on you. And I said, yeah, I heard that. And he said, well, $10,000, you're a dead man. How do you feel? And I said, well, I'm pretty insulted. I thought I'd be worth 50 by now. <laughs> <laughs> and we sort of, although it was flippant, it was serious, you know. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I mean, and some of the people that I knew then I went to school with, uh, I were sort of around the area. Uh, one of my school buddies, his dad was called Eddie, and my mm. dad's nickname was Eddie. He was his boss this, on the waterfront, mm. and he ran the S- an SP. And um, so one night while I went to visit him, they were running an SP at the Osborne Hotel in the Valley, and damn me if the, a hitman doesn't turn up <laughs> at the bar, so I took care of him. Yeah. And um, But the... Uh, some of the boys that were there, they're still alive. We just got together in Brisbane while I was there reminiscing. Because when I hit him, everybody thought I shot him. And uh, so that was pretty interesting. That happened a couple of times. So, John, do you still look over your shoulder these days? Yes. It's an old habit. Old I, um, is, yeah. I still, um, I'm cautious. 
Mm. I don't consciously walk around, glancing around, looking around. You know, no, I no, enjoy no, life. I understand that. And um, but you know, I was working counterterrorism in the Gulf, and I work as some. I'm still a cop in the U.S. I mm. work there. Yes, I, I can verify that because you've shown me your ID and your <laughs> and your police badge. Yes, so I um, and uh, there I feel a bit more comfortable. I'm working with a team, you know, and we're mm. sort of. But you still got to be careful. Mm. Um, I can't go back to Colombia. Um, we exposed <laughs> something there, and yeah. um, I had. To, I thought it was strange me training the military bodyguards, and then they had to escort me <laughs> to out, the of the air, yeah, out of the country because my life was on the line. I thought that was pretty funny at the yeah, time. Yeah, that's amazing stuff. I mean, how do you keep your nerve? I mean, it's uh, you, you. I leave I mean, it to, behind, actually. To, I leave to, it, to say I, that you live on the edge would be understating things. Yeah, but I love that. Yeah, I enjoy it. John, we might just take a very quick break and uh, we'll come back and talk some more once I've regained my composure. <laughs> sure. This, this is, is the Sattler File. Devright Homes, when you're looking for attention to detail and uniquely designed home to suit all your needs. At Devright Homes, we only build a limited number of homes per year, so we can truly focus on what you want out of a prestige home builder. We've continually won awards for excellence, with a record number of wins last year, and the proud winner of the Australian Townhouse Villa of the Year. While we love building homes to suit each client, we pride ourselves on designing homes that take into account the special safety needs of some of our clients. If you have a dream, we can make it come true. Talk to Jay Mangano and find out more about Devright Homes at www.devright.com.au. A kiss, a long embrace, a fond farewell should be personal. That's why personal funerals allow you to remember the life of your loved ones in a way that truly reflects their individual character. It's the difference that makes every goodbye unique. For more information about planning a special goodbye, visit perslowfunerals.com.au because every goodbye is different. I'm John Hughes. I'm very proud of the tremendous amount of repeat and referral business that we do in Victoria Park and this is because I've personally trained all of my salespeople to be non-pushy, friendly and professional and to always provide first class before and after sales service. I jealously safeguard my reputation so if you want the best car buying experience in WA, choose your dealer before you choose your car. That's John Hughes in Victoria Park. DL6061. Is there anything more confusing than the world of finance? Why would you risk managing your own financial affairs without the help of a professional? But you don't want to talk to just anyone. You want financial advice that is both comprehensive and objective. That's what you get from Paramount Wealth Management. As a fee-based firm with no institutional ties, you can be sure that what you get from Paramount is all about your interests and not those of a financial institution. Call Paramount today on 9474 3522 or visit www.paramount.net.au. This is the Sattler Files. Welcome back to the Sattler Files and I'm uh, talking with John Ryan, uh, counterterrorism expert, uh, um, security expert and um, a guy that looks over his shoulder a little bit <laughs> from time to time. <laughs> John, uh, I imagine that um, in terms of uh, your own security, you take a fair bit of um, notice of that as well, like your house and your car and that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah. I've got, I got to admit, I have um, – nothing is in my name in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I have things in my name in America and um, Dubai. That's about it. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I um, – that was um, – that's just natural to me to do that. Mm. And um, I have a way of um, – well, I teach people about um, their security, their personal security and everything. So mm. I guess I've um, – and I've been doing it, what, 51 years, 52 years next January since I started in it. And I love what I do. But I found, um, thankfully, working with um, a lot of young Asian boys when I was young with martial art training and everything, I found that I can leave things behind immediately. Mm -hmm. And to me, I am um, I joke a lot and annoy people and I talk a lot, but the whole thing is I guess that's my barrier yeah. because I put that between me and what I do. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know even um, recently while we were in the Caribbean, 
uh, one gentleman uh, turned around and um, I scared him. Um, but he felt that my wife brought out the soft side in me, which he was very astute of him, actually. Mm. And um, But I, when he spoke to me the first time, I was working, so I was a different person. And the next time he saw me, we were sitting around socially on a voyage uh, down to the West Indies. So mm. that, was, that was a different me. That's mm. me when I'm not working. Yeah, okay. So I'm totally different. And I found that's the easiest way. Mm. Yeah. And I, I suppose that um, <coughs> uh, even having a circle of friends, you know, you would have to learn to trust them, wouldn't you? Because, I mean, in the sort of work that you've done over many, many years, there's been some situations that you've been in and, and people that you've met and probably crossed in many ways. Uh, learning to trust somebody and allowing people to get close to you like that, is that hard to do? Sometimes, yes, uh, because things would happen that um, – I'll give you two instances. In one instance, I was working for – in the United States and I was training, working in a training team from the Sheriff's Department and um, I started to suspect my offsider uh, was stealing. Mm. Not by anything I saw. It was just a, I get these feelings when mm. I'm working with somebody close. Mm. I was just something off. So when I left, I just went to my lieutenant and I just said, look, there's something. And the SWAT team commander, actually, I was in mm. the SWAT team. So I left and I found out three weeks later that I was right and he was actually stealing training funds. He was a corrupt really? yeah. He was a thief. So as a matter of fact, I was promoted from sergeant to lieutenant, and I carry that badge that he used to carry. Mm. So that was a bit of a compliment. Mm. The second thing that uh, really made me even more wary was every second week uh, back in the 90s when I was first running the uh, transport security here for the state mm. government on the buses, uh, one of the, two, of the, um, two or three of the detectives I got friendly with would call in and we'd have, we had a very large house at the time and we had a big entertainment area. <laughs> yes. We had a very uh, nice bar. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely so imperative. Every, yes. About every second or third Friday night, we'd all get together, you know, and mm. we'd, we'd, with our wives and everything, and we'd have a nice time, a nice social time. And um, we never got to the pool for some reason. We just seemed to stay around the pool table in the bar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyway, one of them uh, beca- I became really friendly with. Uh, he was in the, I think it was 79 Division, stuff like that, mm. and him and his offsider. And... Um, I, tr- I trusted him that much that they were having a big do down at the casino at the uh, in- international room. Yeah. And I let him borrow one of my Rolexes. Oh, really? Yeah, he wanted to borrow it, you know, and I thought, well, it's a pose night, you know what I mean? Okay, like, yes. Dinner club, the whole bit. And I knew his mom and dad, um, they're very wealthy importers and that, and own some um, liquor outlets and stuff like that. Yeah. So I, said, I thought, yeah, sure. So when he returned it to that was fine. When he returned it to me, it was all polished and nice and wow. You know, I said, you didn't have to do that. You know, I know it costs a lot of money to have the jewelers polish a Rolex. And I didn't take any notice. But some months later, we were on a trip to uh, Phuket. Mm-hmm. And it was basically all policemen and their wives, uh, the assistant commissioner's son, his wife, mm-hmm. me, my wife, and that. And when we came, and it was cheap because it was, um, it was an economical trip. And it was good fun. I don't like Phuket, but it was just, I go to Pat, I prefer Pat here. But anyway, Mm. so anyway, we uh, came back and I walked into the travel agent because it was quite economical and I knew her, her husband was a federal cop. And Mm. I just said, oh, I said, "Um, I might uh, talk about arranging a trip for my wife and I. We go to Pattaya quite often every year and uh, got some friends there. And she said, oh, it's a pity about Muddy. And I said, what do you mean? She said, oh, I have his Rolex and everything stolen while I was up there. And I went, uh-huh. So <laughs> what it boiled down to basically was him and his offsider had borrowed stuff from me and other people, photographed it and said it was stolen from and claimed a big massive insurance claim when they come back to oh Australia. Oh, my God. This is my buddy and his friend. So, yeah, oh, my God, was about right. And uh, he rang me. About a week later, and he said, uh, have you still got your jewellery? And I said, of course I have. He said, no, he said, uh, the dogs are on me, which meant the feather feet, mm-hmm. the uh, internal investigators. So he came to my office later on that morning, and I said, look, um, don't lie to me in any way, shape, or form. Don't tell me you used my watch for an insurance claim while we were on, while we were on holidays. And he said, well, it's no good lying to you because I know who you are. He said, yeah, I did. 
Wow. So he went to trial, and they kept paying him. The union paid his lawyers mm. and everything. That's the things that get me going, you know, the, this purple circle stuff. Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. he's just confessed. I'm an independent witness. But for a year before he went to trial, he still kept picking up wages. Good Lord. From the government, you know, as a senior detective. And uh, they announced I was going to, a year later, they've had some witnesses. Then they said, John Ryan's the next witness. So he changed his plea to guilty immediately. Goodness me. And neither of them went to jail. Come. I mean, they, neither they of them could... went to jail. The judge said, thought punishment enough with the publicity and fined him three grand or something. And Oh, my goodness You me. know what I mean? That's so unfair, isn't it? Well, I just, um, justice isn't necessarily um, follow the offences. But that's me. I, I'm, I don't get involved in that part of it. I'm, no. I'm an investigator and um, I'm still licensed here. I still work in security and I still do investigations and um, mm. I still train um, security people here. I'm one of the uh, firearms trainers. And I, I love that. I mm. love what I do. With, with, with all your experience, and I mean, you've had enormous experience and such wide and varied experience as well, do you develop a sixth sense about people when you meet them? Is it something that yeah, you've I've, developed over the years? Yeah, I think you do. What, what I did was um, I, I started training with uh, interrogators. Uh, that was the first training I had. Unfortunately, that was in the jungle in Laos, so <laughs> the training by the Americans wasn't really nice training. <laughs> no, I'll bet. I'll uh, bet. We had certain ways of asking. They had certain ways of asking things yes. of uh, North Vietnamese people. But mm. I really did get interested in that part of it. And um, I trained with a retired Las Vegas cop on the so-called lie detector because mm. I think anything to help you find the truth was pretty important. And the only unfortunate thing is that um, I found I could very – even while I was being trained, I beat it without trying. And um, then years later, I went on to voice stress analysis. I became so intent on that, I finished up with qualifiers as an instructor in the U.S. Good. Um, my wife and I actually invested money in that because we thought this is real. This one, but then when I was in Indonesia on a job, I beat it, and I thought, my God, nothing works. So mm. I realized that all these. So then I looked into the people who were the head of the so-called polygraph and the head of the voice stress analysis, and I found all the heads of them in America, their PhDs, they bought them. Oh. Fifty dollars to one hundred and forty nine dollars was the average cost. It was all crap. Everybody was a layman. They were either cops, retired, or military. No one was uh, scientists. There were no academics involved. Good so I did the Lord. opposite. So we put a pool of money together and uh, we hired. Mm. Um, I went to a scientific instrument manufacturer here in Perth, who's uh, qualified by the UWA, a <laughs> real university. Uh, yeah. I then went to on the. Um, uh, uh, the uh, recommendation of a professor from um, a university. I went to a PhD programmer from um, who graduated from Curtin, and I knew it was writing programs for the government already. And I put them all together, and we came up with our own software, uh, which now we have in about six or seven countries. I've used it in many places. We've mm-hmm. used it. Um, matter of fact, they used it in the um, War Crimes Tribunal back in 2013, and uh, with. Good results. Uh, it's just been used on South Africa. It, they sent 200 recordings to America for our people to use, and they've got a 100% hit on everything. They're able to confirm right. everything. Have you been able to beat it? I've been, no. <laughs> I, I still try and beat it, though, because I, yeah. I think, you know, well, I anything mean, done by humans is possible to get around. But yeah. it's the only one ever since the 1930s when the Californian cop first produced the polygraph, and then a cartoon writer... Um, who was a psychologist who wrote the cartoon Wonder Woman, added the blood pressure to it and said it was infallible mm. in 1938, and that turned out to be a whole lot of hogwash. <laughs> <laughs> so I so I went right into it and sort of um, I was pretty uh, stoked last year. As a matter of fact, a year yesterday, mm. the Malaysian government released it on the front page of the Star newspaper that they'd been using it and had used it in the Sabah incident for terrorism. Uh, with a hundred percent result, and uh, their new anti-corruption people are going to be trained on it, which they wow. have now done. I've mm. trained them now. Fantastic! So I'm pretty happy about that. I so. bet you are. Yeah. So if corruption stops, I'm out of business. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just say that I don't think that I think you've got a very bright future. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm getting a bit long in the tooth now, but I, I'm I'm still um, rattling along, and um, yeah. I don't have any health problems, and I still love what I'm doing, and 
I can still that, keep it up with them. That's a that's a great bonus if you love what you do, and uh, you're good at it. I mean, it's it's uh, it's one of those things that's a prescription for long life. Yeah, well, I like. I, I truly love what I do. I think I annoy my wife with it sometimes, but I never bring it home unless she asks. That's mm. another thing I found was easy to do. Unless Katerina asks, I never say anything about work. Mm. Um, do I, you internalize a lot of things? Yeah. You do? I do because I, I sort it out with myself. Mm. <laughs> That's a great talent to have. Even with um, my the interrogators I train in the intelligence agents, I, we do a touch on basic psychology and everything, so... I thought I've been doing this for 18 years on this sort of stuff. So last year I thought I'll do my diploma. So I finished off my diploma in psychology. And mm. actually, I finished off a few diplomas I'd started many years ago. <laughs> Tidy up a few loose Tidy things, up did a you? few things, yes, yes. <laughs> that's, that's quite remarkable. And what about things that, um, look, you know, I, I guess without going into any details, you've obviously seen some things over the years that would probably horrify and distress a lot of people. Um, we talk about counselling and stuff like that. Are you able to deal with those sort of things on your own or do you have somebody or a way of dealing with that? If you see something really unpalatable, you know, subhuman, if you like, you know, it's and so many people get affected by that really badly and they, they blame it on post-traumatic stress disorder and all sorts of other things. How do you deal with that? I do deal with it. I... I um I tell you what I noticed when I was a young man and I first started, I got my first bodyguard job, I was 19. Mm. And then I started helping the bouncers out at that club because the man I was bodyguard and owned the club. And I noticed that bouncers, or crowd control as we call them now, mm. and um, had a, actually used their natural sight to be able to, they'd, someone had walked past them into the club and they'd say, oh, she's going to be trouble, he's going to be trouble. They would know from the way they're, you know. Mm. And the whole thing is that, but then I saw things that were really bad, and um, I think one of the worst was having to. At seventeen, I identified my first body. Oh dear and me! That was in the back of an ambulance, and a train had run over him. Uh, and that was my brother's best friend. That, goodness me! That was the only time I think it was affected. I went to work the next day, and just because of an idiot, uh, put Dougie on the back of his motorcycle and decided to duck a train through the gates, but didn't see the second one. And I was against the gate. It happened right in front of me. Mm. But his mom and dad were very elderly, so the police said, well, would you identify the body? Because I was – the oldest guy was 17. Yeah, <laughs> big deal. 17. <laughs> so I climbed in the back of the ambulance, and they turned all the floodlights on, and I had his head sitting amongst all the flotsam and jetsam, and I identified him. And um, the next day I was at work, and my boss rang my dad, and I said, I think you better come and get John. I heard him, but I mm. overheard him. And then my dad came in to work. And I was working as a delivery driver at the time. And um, I heard my dad and them talk, and I said, I don't think John will ever ride a motorcycle again. Because my motorcycle, I ride it to work the next day. Mm. And I said, the hell I will. So I got on it and rode home. Mm. And I thought, no one's going to stop me, and nothing's mm. going to stop me. So I, and even when I went to trial and I had to give evidence, I was still only 17. I, it never worried me after that. Mm. And I've seen some, yeah, I've seen some really bad things. I, I saw some... So many bad things here in Perth at one stage, I actually thought of writing a book on the buses, <laughs> Western style. <laughs> goodness me. Here in Perth, goodness gracious. Oh, yeah, I saw some stuff in Curl Your Hair. Yeah. Curl mine if I had any. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it, a lot of uh, – you must be uh, have an incredibly strong um, mindset to deal with these sorts of things. I focus on what I'm doing. Um, I – I'm pretty good multitasking around the kitchen, but I'm not <laughs> yeah. too good multitasking out on the street. So if I'm focused to do something, that's what I concentrate on. Yeah. But I totally scan. Or I'm very aware of my surroundings all the time. Yes. And uh, I try and instill that in the guys. Like I just had a class of armed security men every you know Western Australia. They've got to be requalified every six months. Okay. And uh, I had some guys from a couple of different companies there, and I said, I want you to be aware of something, and this is, and I'm not being paranoid. You guys in uniform with a gun on your hip have authoritative representation by your presence. Be aware of lone wolf incidents that you could become a target no matter where you work, whether it's mm. Perth, Melbourne, Sydney. You don't have to be a cop to be attacked. No. And we saw that yesterday. They attacked a school teacher in Paris. Of course we did, yeah. So this is um, 
I try to instill everybody to be uh, careful because when you're doing something a long time, you do it by rote. Mm. And I found that was the biggest fault of most guys I work with in uniform. Mm. That's interesting, being aware of your surroundings. I mean, that th- that is a skill, isn't it? On, on yeah, its it's a skill we have naturally, but it's one that needs to be developed, I think, mm. quite frankly. that um, I mean, I've just been in Dallas with my wife and I stayed downtown because uh, now you can go into the um, uh, building where the assassin shot Kennedy. Mm-hmm. Where you, and you never used to be able to go inside. You could walk around, but you, but now you can go inside, and they've got a great big thing there. So I thought, well, we'll stay downtown Dallas because I've been there before. What I didn't know was that when we walked out of the hotel, a very high-class hotel, when we walked out of the hotel, those two blocks were two of the most dangerous blocks I've ever walked in my life. Is that right? And I was there as a tourist. I wasn't doing any business there. It was the first time I'd been in America. I wasn't, didn't have a gun on, and I thought, man, <laughs> Where's my gun in Ohio? Or mine down in Texas? Because <laughs> that was, and I was very conscious, uh, mm. and there was street um, thugs everywhere. It was really dangerous. But I mean, it, it's something that everybody should be aware of their surroundings, shouldn't they? Oh, I mean, it's, it's not just somebody, a professional like yourself, but everybody should be aware of their surroundings and and um, be um, aware of possible danger and possible sort of consequences of things. Yeah, because if you're – I mean, I know when I was um, running the uh, security on the buses here, I used to go to shopping malls and give talks to mm. um, different groups, youth, youth groups, uh, pensioners and all that, mm. that even while you're on public transport, there are things you shouldn't do, like don't put your bag down beside you and all that sort of stuff. You know? Yeah, yeah. But be aware of where s- – certain types of people get on buses or yeah. public transport, then you should move away. Yes, know? yeah. Avoid. I have to tell you a funny story about uh, – it's, well, it's against my wife and I don't like telling stories against <laughs> her so much, but we were in Tasmania. Um, this is going back a few years now. We were in Tasmania and, and we'd, we'd been staying with a couple and I wanted to buy a gift for the for the guy that put us up for a mm. few nights and he had always expressed a desire to own a Leatherman. You know those things yes, with all the multiple sure tools on them yep. and all that sort of stuff. So we go into this shop. And we're standing there and Jan's looking at these bits and pieces and then a guy comes in and he's he's got dreadlocks and he's got um, he's wearing a lumber jacket and he's got missing teeth and he's asked to see an axe that's uh, one of those great big axes things. Yeah. And I have freaked because I'm thinking this guy, he really looks as though he's under the influence of some illicit substance. Yeah. So I'm starting to shepherd Jan out of the place and she won't go. She's... T- She's standing there. Women are like that, aren't they? <laughs> and she's standing there, and I'm looking at this guy, and I'm th- and look, I just had a sixth sense about it. And as it turned out, it was probably wrong. I never know, but I made her leave. I just couldn't stand to be there. And I guess that that's just me being a little bit on and judging somebody, a book by its cover, if you like. But at the end of the day, had he started swinging the axe, we weren't going to be there. There was no way I was going to see. I don't consider that a bad thing. To me, that's just cautious. There's -hmm. there's nothing wrong with being cautious. No. Now, if you you went outside, started screaming, "There's a there's an axe murder inside" or something like that. (laughs) That That's being paranoid. Yeah. You know, being cautious. I don't. Yeah. No, we just left, and I've I have worn that. My wife tells that story on me (laughs) so many times, and they all call me paranoid. But I'm sorry. I. I, But I wasn't paranoid. I didn't call the cops or anything. I just didn't want to be around him. When you started talking about it, I thought, oh, this guy might have been a timber getter and you didn't even realise. But I, <laughs> He which, may well have been. Well, I, when I was young and I started in the industry, I used to go to the courts and sit down, you know, they'd parade the drunks every morning. Yeah, yeah. There was one guy in Brisbane. He was a character. He'd been going to the – he'd been thrown in jail every week for 10 years or 15 <laughs> years, every week. But drunk, you know, he's homeless, he's an yeah. ex-World War guy and he just yeah. had nothing. Yeah. So he, he got up one day, I think the fine was three shilling, one pound three or something. This before. So, <laughs> one and, pound uh, three, yeah. So the magistrate said, well, you know, listen, George, I'm just sick of you coming into my court. You know, you're really tying up the court's time. He said, I should have you locked up. And he said, well, look, I've got a job now. He said, um, so I'd really be appreciative and I need the money because I've got to buy some tobacco and I've got to get to work. So he said, you really have? He said, 15 years you've been coming in here, or 20 years, whatever it was, you know, and the, well, the cops, everybody's looking around. I'm thinking, you know, because I've seen this guy so many times myself. And he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm a timber getter. He said, really? He said, yeah. He said, that's a hard job. He said, yes, it is. He said, that's what, he said, well, look, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to give you a suspended fine, a suspended sentence. He said, where's the job? He said, One Tree Hill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, 
the magistrate let him go <laughs> anyway. It was just fantastic. cracked. Ever. That was one of. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I would have been. I would have been eighteen when I. And yeah. I'd never forgotten that. The, I just yeah. one of the funniest things I've ever seen. So yeah. that sort of counteracts some of the crap. Mm. I mean, I remember we had a when we started late night buses here down in Northbridge, and one of the worst things that happened that first couple of nights was a guy was knifed around the corner and a baby was grabbed and sexually assaulted by a man out of the park. Mm. And I was there and I thought, well, you, you couldn't get much rotten than that. No, you, know you I mean? can't, no. And um, I fa- the one thing I found was uh, bodies and that never worried me. Mm. Um, the one thing I couldn't stand was um, real bad smells. Um, we did a drug raid in Texas and it was really in a deserted house and they'd been living – you know, there was no sewerage, but they'd still were using everything. It was no. really bad. I'll never forget that. No. That smell no. stuck with me for a long time. Oh, I bet it reminded it did. me of the jungle <laughs> when we went on body searches. You know? Yeah. Uh, been yeah. fascinating stuff. But I, I have, um, we travel a lot mm. because what we do, I go over to do some work, then we stay another week or two, and I take my wife with me, and we'll stay at a hotel instead of. They did offer me to stay in the uh, police academy in Malaysia, and I said, well, with due respect to the inspector general, I said, well, with due respect, if I was 20 Muslim and single, I probably would. But yeah, but another of those things, I think I'll stay at the Intercontinental. <laughs> Good decision, John. Good decision. <laughs> and your book, uh, I Survived, that's still in print, is it? Still in print, just been reprinted. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, just started selling it for sale in America on eBay, and I didn't even realise that. Mm. Um, Amazon, I got it up. You can get an e-copied from Amazon as well. Well, I think that's what I'll do. So, yeah, so I got, um, matter of fact, I've got uh, 20 or 30 arriving this um, Friday because I ran into so many people and they said, no, we don't want to buy the book. We want to buy the book. We want you to get it, sign it, and then send it to us. So, And they said, besides that, you're cheaper than buying it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said, okay. So being, I've got a whole shipment of books arriving this Friday. So. Being called cheap is not a good thing. Yeah. Is it oh, nice? <laughs> well, my my dad said my wife and I were El Cheapo. He couldn't <laughs> believe we'd bargain for prices in a normal shop like we did in Hong Kong. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> John, we're just about out of time. But thank you so much for being with us today. It's, it's, it, oh, you're a here. fascinating guy to talk to. I really hope that I have the chance to. If how it gets better too soon. I won't, but um, I really would love to, the opportunity to talk with you again on the Settler Files. Unlike MacArthur, I'll be back. <laughs> Look forward to it. Thanks so much again, John. Bye. This, this is, is the Settler Files.